It has been used since the beginning of time to influence and confuse, to bring about feelings of pride or hatred. The definition of propaganda is information, especially of a biased or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. And even though it may have morphed from pamphlets and films to videos and social media, propaganda is a way of life used by politicians, companies, organizations. Today, a conversation about computational propaganda and how it's being used to influence and incite in modern day America. Next. Good afternoon, I'm Steve Spreester. We are live in the heart of the KSAT 12 newsroom as we tape this live stream on computational propaganda. Our guest today is Trinity Professor Aaron Delwich. He's with the been with the Department of Communications since 2003. He teaches courses on topics like game development, computer hacking, and political propaganda. But today we're going to talk about the role of propaganda in our lives in our democracy, what's going on with COVID-19, so many different topics to get into. Aaron, Professor, thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanna welcome the audience from Trinity University that's part of the Tiger Network on this whole thing as well, as well as our KSAT viewers. Right off the top, how did you get interested in the topic of propaganda? Uh, hi, it's great to be here. Um, I first became interested in the topic of propaganda actually as a college student in the mid to late 1980s. I, I was really interested in Central American politics and not particularly thrilled about some of the rationales that were being proposed for advancing policy in that area. And at the school that I attended, they had this fascinating program that would allow undergraduates to teach college courses if they could get backing from a professor. And once the professor signed the form, you were able to teach the class. So the very first college class I ever taught was I think in 1988, um, it was a course on propaganda. And, and since then it has been an ongoing research interest. Talk about the definition of propaganda. The way, the way we read it in the open, it has to do with just politics, but you see it broader than that, correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, so many people don't realize that the word propaganda etymologically uh, stems from the Catholic Church. Uh, the term was originally used in the context of propagating the faith, and it was seen as a very positive thing. Um, for this reason, even today, in countries that have a close historical relationship with the Catholic Church, for example, Italy, um, you will find that the term propaganda is used in a much more neutral fashion, much like somebody might talk about publicity or advertising or marketing or promotion. Um, so, so the term really does encompass all sorts of persuasive activity, not just political activity, but also commercial activity. And that's my question. We're not talking about just politics here. I mean, co companies can use propaganda. I mean, uh, city states can use propaganda. I mean, it can be used in so many different ways. Absolutely. So it is wielded at all levels of society by, by large organizations, established institutions, by nation states, but also by smaller political groups, uh, by activist groups. And, and so, um, you know, it makes sense that in a democracy, propaganda would be very important because in a totalitarian state or an authoritarian state, the way you get people to do something is through force. But in a democracy, that doesn't work. We don't put up with that. So if you want people to do something uh, or behave in a certain way, you have to convince them that it makes sense to do so. And so persuasion is important in democracy and, and propaganda is inevitable in a democracy. It will always be with us, I believe. Is it necessarily a dirty word? It is not necessarily a dirty word. It is often a dirty word. Often propaganda has been used to um, propagate many atrocities and many terrible things. but. You know, I can think of positive examples of propaganda as well. So when um, we were first coming to terms with uh, COVID and the coronavirus, propaganda techniques were used by public health communicators to explain to people the importance of washing their hands and social distancing. Um, you can think of uh, things like don't mess with Texas or click it or ticket highway safety advertisements that use basic propaganda techniques to achieve positive social ends in a constructive manner. Talk about when I think historically about propaganda, I think of Nazi Germany and how they used propaganda. Is that a historically significant uh, part of your class? And is it historically significant when you look at the at the arc of what we've seen in propaganda so far? Well, it is certainly historically significant. And um, part of the reason it is so historically significant is because the Nazis were manipulating media such as film 
and radio. And those today we see as sort of established old media forms. But at that time, they were new media for the citizens who lived in that era. And in fact, they were newer media at that time than the internet and social media are for us today. And, and so you had this example of a rising fascist movement that had its hands on emerging communication technologies that many people did not fully understand. And, and the Nazis were extraordinarily effective in, in using those technologies to promote their message and to promote genocide and war. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that propaganda has changed quite a bit in the past century. And if we are only looking for propaganda uh, that looks like Nazi totalitarian propaganda or Soviet totalitarian propaganda, we may very well, in fact, we definitely are missing out on contemporary forms of propaganda. Let's talk about some of the contemporary forms of propaganda and, and what we're talking about. I know a lot of that, we have a slide that, that talks about bots and sock yes. puppets, which a lot of people maybe are familiar with bots. I'm not as familiar with sock puppets. So first off, give us the definition of what bots are. Yeah, certainly. So bots are, um, I mean, you can imagine them sort of conceptually in your head, almost like a robot, but really they're just pieces of software code uh, that control fake accounts. Um, usually we're talking about Twitter accounts and Twitter bots. You also will see bots often on Reddit, but um, Twitter is is an ecosystem in which bots thrive. And, and these bits of code are deciding what a fake Twitter account will post and in how often and in response to what. Um, so for example, if you have a message that you want to propagate, you could have an army of bots that are pushing it out from different fake accounts in sort of synchronized or staggered ways. Um, they appear to be human beings, but they're not. They're just computer code, which is disseminating information according to some predetermined criteria. How do we know if w the person we think we're dealing with is actually a bot or not? Is there an easy way to find that out? Well, yes and no. I think the, the best way, if, if you're interacting with someone to find out if they're a bot, is to really engage in conversation with them, which is just a good thing to do in democracies anyway. Because one of the things we know about bots is that they tend to not reply to actual human outreach. You know, um, it, it would be very obvious very quickly if you were interacting with a Twitter bot just by the nature of their responses. But that's just one thing that, that you can do. There are also sites out there. There's one called bot or not. Um, I think it uses a tool called Botometer. And you can visit that site and enter a Twitter handle, and it will tell you sort of the approximate probability that that, that ID is actually linked to a bot. It's not perfect, though, and, and you really do have to be careful because um, you don't want to accuse a real human being of being a bot if you're not absolutely certain. All right, that's a whole um, different world when you're talking about bots or not and a botometer and, and all <laughs> these things that I did not know even existed. It really is. Talk about sock puppets next. Yeah, so sock puppets, I think um, the, I think people have maybe heard of sock puppets. They're sometimes referred to as trolls. And um, the term troll is sort of a misnomer because originally in the emerging internet, trolls were people who went online and just received psychological gratifications from causing grief to people. You know, they might crash a forum that's devoted to cats and cat lovers talking about their pets and then post all sorts of images of, you know, bad things happening to cats. Um, just the, the, the original definition of troll was just somebody who liked to get a rise out of people online. Um, today, that, that term is often used as well to apply to what researchers refer to as sock puppets. Sock puppets are fake identities that a human being will adopt when interacting online. So um, one classic example was during the Russian disinformation efforts leading up to the election, there was an account which appeared to be a, a woman who was a homemaker in the Midwest, but it was actually um, a, a Russian intelligence officer who was disseminating um, disinformation. Um, sock puppets the, the software that allows people to control sock puppets will sometimes allow someone to control 5, 10, 15, 20 different fake identities and kind of keep all of the stories aligned um, as they're, they're trying to propagate a message. Interesting. Yeah, I've heard of trolls, sock puppets I wasn't that familiar with. So they're, they're almost the same thing. Yeah, I'd say the contemporary understanding of trolls when we talk about troll farms is really about the same thing as sock puppets. And there's a third kind of in-between category, which makes a lot of sense, which is sort of the cyborg, which is 
um, you know, an account that is controlled mainly by computer code. So most of the time it's a bot, but then a human can kind of drop in and drive the account if someone else is interacting with them, for example. So, um, and so cyborg accounts are increasingly popular. Is the goal for most of these if to just create chaos? Well, it depends upon the, the propagandist and, and the, the organized effort that's happening. In the case of Russian disinformation efforts in the United States, I would say um, pretty much unanimously intelligence agencies and analysts concur that the number one goal is to divide Americans and undermine faith in the integrity of our democracy. And so bots and sock puppets since 2014 uh, guided by Russian propagandists have really been kind of highlighting legitimate grievances and disagreements that Americans have with one another and just driving a wedge of anger and outrage on, on top of, of, you know, already pre-existing anger and really trying to, to get people divided and pitted against each other. But in the 2016 election, one of the goals was also to discourage people from turning out to vote. Um, and, and so it was a combination of dividing people, but also convincing people why vote? It doesn't make a difference. You know, they don't care about you anyway. And then the third goal uh, that Russian disinformation propaganda has had, and this is something that um, has been concluded by the, the GOP-led Senate Intelligence Committee that looked into bots last year, um, was to influence the outcome of the election. And they had a candidate that they favored, who was Donald Trump. I'm not alleging that Donald Trump was involved in any way in that, but Intelligence agencies across the board have concluded that in 2016 and in 2020, Russian bots are actively trying to divide Americans, to undermine faith in democracy, and to reelect President Trump. Yeah, there is no question that Russia is involved in some of these things and that it comes from the upper levels of Russian government, correct? Absolutely. That is my understanding. And, and I think there's much research to support that. Who are the other major players when it comes to computational propaganda, which is the topic we're talking about? What other foreign governments are using this? OK, so um, we also have seen um, very sophisticated domestic propaganda efforts using computational propaganda in China. Um, it originally, it was focused more internally, the domestic propaganda, um, using computational propaganda uh, to, to silence opposing views and um, using trolls and sock puppets to promote views of the party. Um, in the last few years, uh, certainly inspired, I'm, I'm sure, by uh, the success of Russian disinformation efforts, there has been more of a presence of Chinese computational propaganda that targets Americans as well. And, and also we see um, Iranian computational propaganda, which is targeting Americans. So Iran, China, and Russia are all engaged in computational propaganda, as is the United States. I mean, we, we have our own tools for doing these things. In fact, um, there was something called Operation Earnest Voice which was a project from about 10 years ago that, that basically set up software that um, our military could use in the Middle East to propagandize on behalf of our strategic goals there. So the countries are the United States, Russia, China, Iran. Those are some of the, the major countries, certainly as far as um, United States citizens are concerned. I think that the most significant player is Russia. Um, the scale is, is simply not comparable at this point. What does it look like? I mean, what do, what do, what do, what do these propaganda campaigns look like in modern day America? Well, um, the, you know, it's, it's a great question because in the 20th century, certainly in the era of Nazi propaganda and, and throughout most of the 20th century, propaganda campaigns were really focused on a single message, a consistent message that was unified and repeated again and again. And, and propagandists did not want to lie um, not because they had ethical objections, but because when you get caught lying, it, you lose your credibility. So, you know, old propaganda orthodoxy was try to tell the truth as much as possible and stay on message all the time. But contemporary propaganda, certainly what we're seeing in terms of Russian disinformation and the sort of propaganda that, that Putin has used internally in Russia as well, is much more scattershot. It's almost like throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks and um, not trying to just stick with one consistent message. And so the, the propaganda messages that are being sent out could all contradict each other. So it, it is, it might seem surprising at first to think that the same Russian disinformation propagandist could be controlling a fake account pretending to be a member of the Tea Party, 
uh, interested in lowering taxes, as well as controlling an account which pretends to be, you know, supporting Black Lives Matter. And these are two accounts that we would think of, you know, as, as very different. But I think from the standpoint of Russian propaganda, if it serves the goal of polarizing Americans, undermining faith in democracy, and, and helping to, you know, reelect their favorite candidate, they will continue to pursue that. When you look at, when you look at the political spectrum, is there one side of the political spectrum that uses computational propaganda more than the other side, or does it depend on the year and the election cycle we're in? That's a great question. I think that um, right now, in terms of, of computational propaganda, I would say that the far right has, has had a bit of a head start uh, in, in terms of really kind of of pushing the boundaries of this. And I think one one distinction that I, I did not introduce is sort of, um, you know, authenticity. Because, you know, talking about things like sock puppets and bots that pretend to be human, those are all completely dishonest forms of computational propaganda. And that's primarily what I've been talking about so far. But you could think about other types of computational propaganda that are used by the, the mainstream Democratic Party and the mainstream Republican Party, which use computers to propagate messages in a systematic way, but don't kind of reach the same level of dishonesty. So, you know, I get many messages on my phone from Beto O'Rourke. Um, I don't think it's really him. And that's OK. I know that it's probably a computer or some sort of algorithm which is targeting me. but. Um, the far right and Russian disinformation has really been more in that outer realm, kind of beyond authenticity, deliberately lying, misrepresenting in an attempt to achieve their ends. It's interesting, so, it's interesting because, yeah, when, we, when you bring this up, I think back to uh, the Barack Obama campaign and how his database was lauded as a huge thing. That, that won him the president, won him the Democratic nomination and then won him the presidency. Then you think back to, you know, three and a half years ago and uh, Brad Parscale, who's from San Antonio, used a database and Facebook and targeting and things like that in the same way. Are right. they the same way or are they a little different? Well, they're different, but I think that it is a very important point. Yeah, uh, the Obama campaign was was hailed for their clever use of social media, and it involved very careful micro-targeting based on data mining of available data. And, and I think that uh, Parscale um, did a very effective job of doing those sorts of things in a more contemporary environment, figuring out how to leverage Facebook's advertising targeting and kind of exploiting uh, the existing social media infrastructure uh, to promote his candidate. And I think in terms of, of what we know about the Parscale operation, um, you could say they're, they're mostly comparable. I think that the one difference with Parscale would be kind of the intersection with Cambridge Analytica and, and data mining that happened on Facebook that really was in a sort of more gray area. And um, I want to be cautious in how I, I make that linkage because I don't, I don't, think it has definitively been established the exact extent of the connection between Parscale and Cambridge Analytica, but there is definitely a connection there. And, and the difference there was um, that much of that data had been collected from people completely without their knowledge who thought they were answering you know, lifestyle survey and then ended up having that information used to, to target back to them. Do you see evidence that the left is trying to catch up with the right when it comes to our political parties uh, and the net and the election that we're just three months away from? Yeah, I, I think that um, so and I, I'll keep that sort of distinction between like sort of legitimate computational propaganda that, that's working within the boundaries of both the law and ethics. Um, and then that sort of second sphere, which is more illicit and misrepresentational and, and just you know, dishonest propaganda. So in terms of the sphere of kind of legitimate computational propaganda, I think, yes, absolutely, the Democrats, the left, progressive movements have really been, you know, catching up. Um, and uh, I think it is, it is very wise for them to pursue those strategies because um, it, it's just part of how we communicate in contemporary politics. Um, but I, I also think that there's that second realm of more dishonest, and illicit uh, propaganda. 
And I would love to be able to tell you as a Democrat and a liberal that, oh no, the left never does these things. But I, I was really disappointed. And I want to say the scale is very different in, the, in terms of these two things. But I was very disappointed to discover about two years ago that when uh, Roy Moore was running for re-election in Alabama, it was a very close race, um, that some of like computational propaganda researchers like myself were experimenting with those same techniques on a very, very small scale that they had seen Russia using. And it was a disaster. I think it was terrible for the credibility of researchers. It was a disaster in terms of credibility for the Democratic Party. It was a small scale operation and not very effective, but it, it was absolutely unethical, both in terms of research and political activism. But I, I do not believe at all that that's representative of the, the mainstream Democratic Party. I think that um, it's weird because, you know, propaganda happens on all sides of the political spectrum. And, and that's just a really hard thing to, to accept that things that we agree with could also be distributed via propaganda. But um, having said that, there is a, a sort of lopsided thing happening right now. And that's why I really kind of try to keep the focus on how the Russian disinformation is trying to affect the political landscape. Uh, because that the scale of that and the intent of that to undermine democracy, to divide people and, and to, you know, um, to just encourage people to not even show up to vote. I mean, that's just um, absolutely unacceptable. And I think so. The intent is key as well as um, dishonesty. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. How alarmed are you by some of the campaigns that you've seen from these different countries into the United States? I am very alarmed. Yeah, I, I am alarmed. I am alarmed by the the scale of the Russian disinformation operation. I'm, I'm alarmed by the conspiracy theories which have taken root. I mean, and conspiracy theories have been part of American political history since actually before the American Revolution. There have been people talking about the Freemasons and the Illuminati, uh, but they really have ramped up in the past, you know, 10 years and, and definitely since 2014. So conspiracy theories such as the, the QAnon theory, which, you know, postulates that there's this whole cabal of world leaders who are engaged in, in you know, pedophilia and sex trafficking. I mean, just in, in everything, basically every evil in the world gets traced back to this. It's a very far-fetched theory, but it is being propagated and fueled by this kind of disturbing confluence of both Russian disinformation, um, which is really pushing it out through bots and sock puppets, but then it's also being picked up on the far right in the United States domestically. And I think we have 11 people who are either in office or running for office right now who are, are followers of that conspiracy theory. Yeah. And, and, and that troubles me deeply. And I say this as someone who, when I was younger, did, I mean, I still am very interested in conspiracies, you know? Um, so I, I understand the appeal of these conspiracies, but, but they're very dangerous. And that's my next question is, are some of these conspiracy theories playing out when we talk about COVID-19 and we talk about the coronavirus? I mean, I, I, what is the role of computational propaganda when we talk about a pandemic? That is that is a great question. And, um, you know, researchers at Carnegie Mellon were studying this shortly after we, we became aware of COVID and the lockdowns began. And they noted that about 10 to 20 percent of the time in ordinary political online discourse, you know, by their metrics, about 20 percent of the accounts were bots. That's pretty typical these days, 10 to 20 percent. But when it came to conversations about COVID and coronavirus, it was more like 50 to 60%, more than half of the accounts that were putting messages out there were actually bots. And, and many of these accounts were Russian bots. And um, there are two main conspiracy theories that were promoted related to COVID. And, and one of them is the idea that 5G cell towers somehow cause us to be susceptible to COVID or, or the link. And um, conspiracy theorists would take a, a map and show, here's a map of all the hotspots for COVID. And then they'd show another map and say, here's a map of where all the 5G towers were going. So obviously 5G towers cause COVID. But what, you know, there are many other explanations, such as the fact that we tend to first put the cell towers in more populated, densely populated parts of the economy in the world. So they're kind of be a natural correspondence there between 5G towers and COVID. And also, if you looked really closely, there were lots of places where it didn't line up the way they were saying. But as a result of this 
conspiracy theory, there have been people who've actually been damaging 5G towers. And then I, it did occur to me, you know, when I was thinking about it, okay, so hypothetically, if this theory is partially being pushed by Russian intelligence, would they have any sort of actual reason to want to slow the uptake of 5G in the United States? And I think, sure, absolutely, economically, in terms of national security. I mean, that actually makes sense as an ultimate outcome that they would be pursuing. Uh, we have some questions from people that are watching this live stream right now, and I, I love that people are asking their own questions of us on here. Uh, the first one is, the general feeling from the media is that people are either left or right. I've always felt more people are in the middle. Do we think 80% of people are in the middle or is it more disparate than that? That is a, a great question. I think the way surveys are often framed, they, they make it sound like it's, it's a much smaller amount that is in the middle, um, you know, but that's sometimes how, how the questions are framed. You know, they'll say, oh, 35 to 42%, you know, on one side, about 50% on the other, and then maybe eight to 10% in the middle. But um, it, it's all about, the surveys are all about how you frame the question and who are you going to vote for in the next election. I would very much like to believe that more people are in the middle than, than those surveys suggest. And I do, I think I, I think most people, and I'm, I'm still idealistic, you know, even at the, the age of 53, and even after studying this, I, I do believe that most people are basically decent and want the same sorts of things. And I think what's happened is that propagandists have been very good at convincing us that, that if we have a legitimate disagreement with someone, whether it's about Black Lives Matter or abortion or, or anything, that, that that legitimate disagreement necessarily means we have to be on opposite sides and that the person we disagree with is evil. And that's, I, I don't think that's true. I don't, things are that, don't think things are that black and white, but I think that's the dangerous effect of, of much recent propaganda is to push us further and further apart. And it's incumbent upon us to realize uh, that we don't have to be that way. We can try to find common ground even while we respect disagreements. Absolutely, all right. I 100% agree with you. I'm an optimist in that, in that facet of life as well. All right, the next question, do Facebook and other social media play into the bot experience experience yeah, yes absolutely um and i think that um twitter in particular for bots tends to be a more fertile ground for bots simply for um technical reasons uh they very early on opened up their application programming interface to programmers so that people could integrate twitter feeds easily into their websites and just some of the stuff that is just available to anybody to, to do with Twitter makes it easier for bots to flourish on Twitter than in other social media environments. But across all of these social media environments, like Facebook and Twitter, especially you know, Instagram, um, you know, these are uh, places where sock puppets flourish, but these are also social media platforms which are driven uh, by advertising revenue. And, and basically, you know, we don't have to pay to use Facebook. We don't have to pay to use Twitter. And, and when you're not paying to use a service, there's a pretty good chance that you're actually the product that's being sold. And, and that's what Facebook sells to advertisers. It sells our attention and our time and all of the information about what we like and dislike so that they can target us in a very particular way. So there, there is something within the structure and Google, I can't let Google off the hook. Google absolutely does the same thing. And it's within the structure of the industry um, that really has created fertile ground for these propagandists and bots and sock puppets to flourish. Um, but there are steps they can take to change that. All right, here's my next question. And this is, you, we talked about this before we came on this live stream. What can I do to fight the disinformation and the bots and the sock puppets and all the things that are out there? And it's actually one of our next questions. What should the average citizen be looking for in terms of knowing what's true and what's false? Well. Uh, first, I would like to just mention that there's a site that um, will help with all of these things. It's called Propaganda Critic, and it's at propagandacritic.com. And that, that's a website that I originally created in graduate school and have updated periodically. Most recently in 2018, seriously upgraded and revamped the entire site uh, to take account of computational propaganda. And I, I did that with support from Trinity University and the Mellon Foundation and a really sharp undergraduate student named Mary Margaret Herring. Um, and so that site has all sorts of resources, both about how to identify bots and sock puppets, but also how to analyze 
propaganda messages and how to think about our own cognitive biases. So that, that's one thing. But I think the most important thing is for us not to stop engaging um, in, in politics and the news and our community life and, and to not just engage within our own echo chambers. Um, I think we all have friends and family members that we disagree with politically, you know, that the person who posts things on Facebook every once in a while that we just cringe at, whether, you know, regardless of our political orientation. And there's been a real temptation, I think, for people in this divided time to just give up on each other and, or, or to just give up on the news altogether. But if we do that, then we really have lost because democracy, a functioning democracy relies on us, the citizens, assuming that we will always have things that we disagree about coming together and making just basic decisions and agreements about how to move forward on shared common ground. And so I'd say continuing to engage with people and continuing to pay attention to the news and then using the sorts of resources at a site like Propaganda Critic um, is really helpful. And also, if you're trying to find out if someone is a bot or not, there is a site, I think it's called Bot or Not. You can also Google Botometer, and that site will allow you to put in a handle from a Twitter account, and then it, it sort of minds everything it knows about that account and can tell you a rough probability of whether or not that is a bot. I love what you said earlier, where you said, just because we disagree, and this isn't verbatim what you said, but you said, just because we disagree doesn't mean the person that you disagree with is evil. Like disagreement right. is part of democracy, is it not? It is, absolutely, because if, if you give up that, I mean, if you give up the idea that we can move forward politically with people we disagree with, then you're not left with a lot of room. You're, you're left with situations, well, you're, you're left in a really bad place where you, you can't even deal with a public health crisis. I want you to give the final thought here for us. Like, what do you want us to take away from this live stream today when we're talking about COVID-19 and the future of democracy and propaganda. What would be your message, your closing message for people who are watching this? I think my closing message is that there is a real battle for our hearts and minds being waged right now in, in social media and in traditional media. And often propaganda techniques and computational propaganda techniques are used to manipulate us, to make us feel outraged and angry. And, and sometimes there are things we should really be outraged and angry about, but it's really important to understand that this operation is underway and to really think about the sources of the messages we receive. If I had to boil it all down to just like one tip for identifying propaganda, figure out who is the source. It's not enough for someone to just say, well, many people are saying, or I have it on good authority. Who is the source? Who is saying that? Um, and to just realize it's okay to disagree in a democracy. Aaron Dulwich, Professor of Communications at Trinity University, thank you so much for your time. And I wanna thank everybody that's contributed their questions to this discussion. And, and uh, Professor, I hope this isn't the last time we talk about this because I find this a fascinating topic. I, I feel the same way. I'd love to talk about it again. All right, Professor Dulwich, thank you for your time. Everybody at home and at work or wherever you're watching this live stream, thank you for joining us. Thank you.